So good morning, Faith family. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody doing well? How many of you are thankful that Jesus is our hope and our future? Amen? I tell you, it's just so good to know Jesus and to, to, to just be a follower of Christ is one of the greatest blessings I've ever experienced in my life. It is the greatest blessing I've ever experienced in my life. And so I hope that uh, with you it's the same. Uh, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we have been talking about some very exciting things happening in the life of the church. We've been opening up a little bit more every week and just sort of moving through that process. And, and I tell you, it's been really great. But we've been talking about all the things that are happening in the life of the church, one being that our student ministry is up and running as VSU students arrived and as kids got back into school. One of the things that we did was relaunch our, our student ministry. And it's just been phenomenal to see. And, and in fact, if you have questions or you're wondering about student ministry, uh, tonight is actually parents' night. And so parents, you get to come and be a student tonight uh, to be a part of student ministry and to see what's going on and just to hear what's, what's coming down the the road there a little bit, but uh, also our children's ministry has opened back up. I was talking to Holly this morning, and she was just saying that uh, that more and more volunteers are are just excited about coming back, and even some that had sort of taken a break have already said, you know what, I'm I'm ready to get back in. I miss those kids, and and, and so it's really amazing to see what's happening. This week and next week, we also have our women's ministry kicking back off. And so a lot of uh, different Bible studies are being planned and have been planned and are getting ready to launch. And so if you're looking for a women's Bible study, we have plenty of those that are about to get started. And so if you want more information about that, just see uh, Linnell. Uh, you can ask her for questions or you can go to our website, crosspointchurch.cc slash women. And so you can, uh, you can find out all the happenings there for our women's ministry. Just a lot of excitement, a lot of life change. We, we've seen baptisms of new believers. I was meeting this past week with an with 11-year-old girl who just recently gave her life to Christ. And so she came in and wants to be baptized. And so it's just exciting to see the life change that's happening. And we even have another baptism of a young man in the second service here today. But it's just, God is really moving and God is so awesome, and it's just wonderful to be a part of what God is doing in this place. I want to invite you to go ahead and turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount, which begins in Matthew 5. We're at 6 now. We're going to kind of walk on through there. And we only have two more weeks after today of this series that we've been walking through called Breakthrough where we walk through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Just two more weeks. I'm, I'm going to have to really hurry to get through that. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm not someone who is short-winded. You know that uh, if you've been a part of this, this church for a while. But, but I tell you, I love God's Word. And it just sometimes it just do, it drives me crazy to have to speed through something. But I just want to let you know that uh, after this series, we're going to kick back off uh, with a series called A New Life in Christ Jesus. And we're going to go back to Colossians. You remember we've been walking through Colossians. We did chapters 1 and 2. We're going to go back to Colossians and finish Colossians with chapters 3 and 4. So I am excited. I've been studying. I've been looking through that. And I tell you, God just, you know, here's what God does. He always deals with me before he deals with you because he takes me through it and I wrestle through it. And sometimes I'm like, I don't know, Lord, I, 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 don't, I don't like hearing it. I don't know if anybody, but that's the way God's word is, isn't it? It's sharper than a two-edged sword and sometimes it's, it, it's convicting. And so, uh, but I love that. There's nothing that scares me about conviction because that just reveals to me the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. Amen. And so I tell you, I, I love that. I love just going through God's word and studying. I got to quit talking because I got to pray and we got to dive into this message and we'll be here all day. So let's pray together and then we'll dive into the word here. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for just an amazing time of worship this morning where we get to lift up our voices to you in praise and adoration and just true worship, God. And Lord, just love you for all that you are. And Father, we celebrate our Savior, Jesus Christ, and all that he accomplished on the cross for us and for our behalf. And Father, it's just wonderful to know that, that we can call our Savior, Jesus Christ, our hope. 
Lord, we love you so much. We pray that as we dive into your word this morning, God, that you would, you would just help us to set aside those distractions that may exist in our life. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount, um, I have made several references to the fact that this is the greatest sermon that was ever preached. And why wouldn't it be? I mean, Jesus is the one who preached it, right? Jesus is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Jesus is the one who lived a life without sin. He is the one who, who went to the cross to atone for our sins. Jesus is the sovereign Lord Almighty. Amen? And so if this is who he is, then why wouldn't his sermon be the greatest sermon that was ever preached? Well, in the middle of this sermon, we see what we have come to know as the Lord's Prayer. And the Lord's Prayer is where he turns his attention to his disciples and he instructs them on how disciples are to pray. And so he lays this out. And so this becomes, in my opinion, the greatest example of how to pray. Why? Because Jesus said it, right? Jesus is the one who laid this example out for us. And so we find this right in the midst of this Sermon on the Mount. And so this morning we're going to be talking about how disciples are to pray. Matthew 6 verses 5 through 13 is where we're going to be reading. I was thinking about this and the reality that there's probably been no greater time in my life for prayer than now. There's just so much going on. There have been so many struggles, so many just difficult situations that, that I've had to face, that my family and I have had to sort of walk through and, and still walking through in some ways. And, and, and so it's very difficult times for us just, just personally just having to struggle through the different responsibilities that we have. But as for you as well, I know, I mean, with all that's happening in our world today, I tell you, there's just no, no wonder we're not all crazy or lost our mind with everything that's happening, but, but there's probably just never been a greater time in our life to hear a message on how to pray than now. Now, obviously, Jesus thought it was something that we ought to know because he taught it, right? He's, he's, he's laying out for his disciples things that he thinks is very important for them to understand as he launches his ministry. You remember he's gone up on the side of a mountain, he sat down, he's opened his mouth, and he's begun to preach, and his disciples are at his feet, and they're there to learn what it is to be, to be a disciple. You know, Jesus is laying it out there. Here's, here's what you need to know. This is discipleship 101. This is what Jesus is doing. And the crowds have gathered as well, and they're listening to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And no doubt some of their lives will be transformed as well as they hear the words of Christ as he preaches this message. But prayer is one of those things that we see Jesus take great attention to as he continues in this lesson and he starts to teach them on what prayer looks like for the life of the disciple. I believe that sadly, uh, you know, in today's Christianity, many Christians just don't know how to pray. In fact, I've had people come to me before and say, I'm just not very good at it. I, I, don't, I don't really know how to pray. And, you know, and it's, and it's one of these things where I think a lot of believers, uh, true followers of Christ, just really struggle with how to pray. And so this, no doubt, would be a, a great lesson for those that may be going through something like that. Or maybe some Christians just don't simply see it as very important to pray, you know. Well, I know Pastor Dave is a prayer warrior, so I'll just let him do all the praying for us, you know. And so maybe some just don't see the, the, the importance of individual prayer in, in their life. I once heard this quote, and this may reveal my age, I don't know, because this one's been passed down for years and years and years. But it goes something like this. It says, many Christians uh, offer their prayers like sailors use their pumps only when the ship is leaking or sinking. And that's so true, isn't it? Even as believers, I mean, there are times in our life where we, we sort of get into the routine of life and maybe things are going well and as we're going through life, you know, we just kind of start, you know, boasting maybe in our own accomplishments and we, we forget that we're so dependent on the one who is our hope, Jesus Christ, and we just sort of let prayer go to the wayside and then all of a sudden, you know, there's, there's some critical something that happens in our life, some sort of devastating 
uh, circumstance sort of springs up. The boat starts leaking. In fact, sometimes it feels like the boat is sinking, right? And immediately we're like, oh, yeah, Lord, please help. And we go to the Lord and we just begin to, to cry out to the one who we know can help us. We should have known all along is the one that can just bring so much fulfillment in our life, right? And so that shouldn't be the way it is. For believers, for true followers of Christ Jesus, that really shouldn't be what prayer is to us because prayer for, for the disciple of Jesus is an essential discipline in their life, or at least it should be. It should be one of the things that happens every day of our life. In fact, every moment of our life, if not many moments in our life, I, I think just about every morning when I wake up, one of the things I find myself doing is saying, praise God. I'm alive, you know, I, I, I made it through the night, you know, it's just one of those things. It's just thinking about God and praying to God is, it needs to be a discipline in our life. If we're to experience the full communion with God, we must pray as Jesus taught. And so let's look this morning at our passage, let's read this together and see what it is that Jesus says as he is sharing with his disciples and no doubt to us as well. Matthew 6, starting with verse 5, he says this. He says, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up, up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. I hope this morning that you will hear what I'm about to say. I hope that this morning that the next few words that I say here will be something that you take to heart, write down in your notes, carry out with you, stick them in your pocket, whatever it is that you do. Plug them into your iPhone. But here's what I want to say this morning in reading this text. There is nothing that benefits a disciple of Jesus more than prayer. There is nothing that benefits a disciple of Jesus more than prayer. Now let me say this, God's ultimate purpose in prayer is to glorify himself. There's no doubt about that. That's his purpose in prayer. But in addition to that, we benefit greatly when we become people of prayer. There is so much to be gained when we become people of prayer, when we, when we begin to embrace the spiritual discipline, not only of reading God's Word. Let me just say this, if you're going to understand God's Word, because many of us might think that that may be more a benefit to us than, than prayer, but the thing is, the Scriptures are very clear that if we're going to read God's Word, that it is the Holy Spirit who eliminates the Scripture that we may understand. And so why not go to the Lord in prayer before we ever open our Bibles? That we may understand, that we may seek God to, to help us as we read through the Scriptures and understand God's Word. And so I am convinced that many Christians either don't believe that we benefit from prayer or they just don't see it that way. They don't perceive it that way. They, they have it at their disposal, they just don't use it. Linnell and I love to go out west. We haven't been that much. In fact, she's been telling me she wants to go out there and, and, and do snowmobiling in the, in the mountains, and that's something we've never done. It's, it's cold. I, I don't know about that, but anyway, she's, she loves the cold. She loves to drink coffee by the fire in the cold more than anything. I don't know how she'll do on a snowmobile, 
but she's wanting to go. Well, we love to go out. We don't get to go out west very much. We've been a few times. But on one particular trip that we were going out there, we, we stopped about 30 minutes from Yellowstone National Park, which is one of my favorite places on earth. I love the scenery. I love the, the spectacular views. I love the, the mix of wildlife. I mean, you just it looks like you're in a zoo. I mean, there's so many animals everywhere. And so it's really a remarkable place. And so as we were coming, approaching this uh, Yellowstone, we stopped about 30 minutes out to, to fuel up and get gas. And And so as I went in to buy a few snacks or whatever it is we were doing there, I was talking to the cashier and she said to me, you must be headed into Yellowstone, which she must say to every visitor because she's just 30 minutes away and we're headed that way, right? And so... So she says to me, you must be headed to Yellowstone. I said, yeah, I love it. I've been there before. We're going to do some camping. It's going to be awesome. We're hoping a grizzly doesn't get us. But, you know, those kinds of things. And she says to me, well, I've never been. And I couldn't believe it. I thought she was lying. She had to be lying. I mean, Yellowstone National Park. And she must have seen the surprise on my my face. I said, are you serious? I mean, you're 30 minutes from there. We travel thousands of miles to get there. It's the most beautiful place I've ever been to. You've never been? She said, I've never been. We've just never gone as a family. And I couldn't imagine that that would be a reality in anybody's life that lives so close. I'd be there every weekend. But as I was thinking about that, I thought, that's kind of like it is with us as believers sometimes where prayer is just at our disposal. Prayer is, is just one of the most simple things that we could do. And, and, and we know that there are many believers who discipline themselves and, and, and take great lengths to be prayer warriors, to come to the Lord in, in prayer every single day of their life. But there are others who just have it at their disposal and never use it. And so here as we look at this passage, we, we begin to realize that Jesus sees this as very important. Now, you need to understand that in Luke 11, chapter 11, uh, we see where the disciples actually ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. And so I think this morning as we dive into this message and we really begin to look at it a little deeper that, that maybe we need to this morning Ask the Holy Spirit to teach us how to pray. I am so grateful that we have a prayer ministry that is meeting right now as we gather in this worship center in another room to lift us up in prayer. And I'm hoping that they are praying for us this morning to be impacted by a holy and righteous God who wants to do business in our hearts. And I know he does. That's what he does, right? And so this morning we dive into this. Now, Jesus lays out for them two examples on not how to pray. And this message is titled, How Do Disciples Pray? So I'm not going to spend much time here. But I do want to mention them. I think it's important. He starts off and he first says in verse 5, he says, When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. And then he also says in verse 7, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases. And so, again, we won't dive into this. We just simply don't have time. There's so much more that I want to talk about here this morning. But, and I, and I believe that most of these are pretty crystal clear. They're self-explanatory. But I, I will say this about them both, these verses, that both deal with not being genuine, not being who you are, trying to be someone you're not, And I think about people that may find themselves as hypocrites who offer up prayers and and people who just sort of lift up empty phrases to impress other people. Maybe, Maybe what they're doing is not prayer at all anyway because they're more concerned about self than than God, or more concerned about others and not God. But that's not what we're here to talk about. This morning we're going to dive a little bit deeper into how Jesus does tell us to pray. Because I think this is very, very powerful for us. So let's take a look here this morning. Now, in our passage, as we get toward the end, after he deals with those first two things, Jesus focuses upward. Jesus focuses upward. And this is very important for us. In fact, he gives us three sort of examples of an upward focus or, 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 or a vertical.
vertical focus. You know, thinking about God in our prayers, thinking about who he is, thinking about what he's done, all of these things. And so Jesus says, when you pray, he says, pray like this. Now, I want you to listen to these words. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, we must not miss the importance of Jesus addressing God as Father. This is huge. And you may not have known that. You grew up reading the New Testament, and you see it all throughout the New Testament. And it becomes something that is really just sort of, we just toss it around like it has no meaning. But it has great meaning that Jesus would start off with his disciples when he says, if you're a disciple, pray like this. And then he says here, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We need not miss this. You see, in the Old Testament, God is referred to Father only 14 times from Genesis to Malachi. Only 14 times is God referred to as Father, and then only as it is referencing the nation of Israel. Never on an individual sort of way does the Old Testament ever, you can go from Genesis to Malachi and you can search all day long this afternoon and in fact I would encourage you to do so and you will never find a single individual that ever refers to God as our Father or my Father or Father in their prayers. 14 times in the Old Testament and that is all. But here, Jesus flips everything around. And we know, if you know anything about Jesus, he's pretty good at just sort of flipping things around, wasn't he? Turning the table, so to speak, to, to sort of show us a, 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 the, the Jesus way, the gospel way, as he is preparing to, to present these truths to his disciples. He tells them, he says, as you pray, pray like this, our Father. In fact, this is the only way that Jesus ever addressed God, by calling him Father. As we look through the New Testament, we see that in all of Jesus' prayers, he refers to God as Father. As we read through the Gospels, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we see that over 60 times Jesus uses Father when he addresses the Lord. So in just four books, he just uses this 60 times as he references God as Father. No one in the history of Israel had ever prayed like Jesus was teaching his disciples to pray when he says, pray like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. To the listener that was sitting on the side of that mountain that day when Jesus said this, Jesus' prayer or his instruction to pray would have been revolutionary. It would have been something they had never heard in their life. And so we read the Lord's Prayer. How many of you grew up, you don't have to raise your hand, but I mean, how many of us grew up just sort of reciting the the Lord's Prayer? We've said it so many times in our life. And how many of us, when we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, just sort of go over that as though it has zero meaning in our life other than we're just recognizing God. It's something that we take so lightly and let Jesus, when he presented it to his disciples, was changing their life. He was, he was presenting it in such a way that, that they, were, they were no doubt wondering, where is this going to go? As they begin to think about God being very personal in their life. How many of you this morning are thankful that God is a personal God whom you have a relationship with? And so Jesus here, he's going to, present this to them. He wants them to understand this. He wants them to know. I want you to think about this for a second. You see, to understand God as our Father helps us to understand our adoption as children of God. Think about that. 
All throughout the scripture in the New Testament, we are, we are told, we, we learn that we are adopted. We are, we are a son or a daughter of, of, of God. We, we are his children. And so it's very relational and it's very important for us to understand this. It's essential for us to understand that God is our father. Because knowing God as your father brings confidence and security and protection into your life. When you begin to think of God as your father, you begin to have this overwhelming sense of security and peace knowing that God is there for you as your father. He protects us. He, is, he, 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 he holds us in the palm of his hand. Sometimes when I'm playing with my grandchildren, they will, uh, they will get a little carried away. I mean, that doesn't normally happen in family's life, I'm sure. But in my family, our grandchildren just lose their mind sometimes playing with granddaddy, right? They just go crazy. And they'll do things like they'll climb up on a playground or in a tree or on top of the refrigerator. And they'll say, catch me, granddaddy, right? You know, they, they just want you to, they want to, there's something about a small child that wants to leap out into your arm from great heights. And so when this happens, of course, I go along and I'm like, okay, and I brace for impact, you know, even though they're little and, and I prepare to, to grab them in mid-flight and it's sort of nerve-wracking. And I usually hear Linnell say something like, oh my goodness, please catch them, you know, don't, don't let them fall on their head, you know. And so, you know, it's one of those things. But sometimes I never get that warning. They leap out of a bush like a panther, right? And they just, they come out of nowhere and I sort of see them coming in the, my peripheral and as I notice them, I'm like, brace for impact because my gosh, one of our kids is climbing on top of the house. I mean, you know, you don't, and, and, and here's the thing, they believe with all confidence that granddaddy's gonna catch them. They don't have any fear in their life because they don't see it any other way. Granddaddy always protects them. Granddaddy always takes care of them. Granddaddy never lets them down. And I do everything in my power, including wrecking my back, to keep them from getting hurt, right? Knowing God as our Father instills that kind of confidence now, I'm not saying, please don't hear me. I'm not saying jump off the building today and just watch God catch you. That is not what I'm saying. That's for my grandkids to do, not you. But there's something about trusting the Lord, amen? There's something about knowing God as our Father that instills confidence in us. It gives us a sense of security and protection. We know that despite the circumstances in our life, God will take care of us. There's something powerful about knowing God as our Father. And Jesus knows this. Knowing God as our Father also helps us to be confident in grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Something that we also are very grateful for. Amen? Grace and mercy. Receiving that which we don't deserve. Not receiving that which we do deserve, right? That's grace. That's mercy. Receiving forgiveness or atonement for the wages of our sin, knowing that we get to spend an eternity with a holy and righteous God because he is, well, he is holy and righteous, right? And he, he is there waiting for us. And it's so beautiful to know that, that he has done this for us, that, he is, that Jesus has, has gone to the cross, and on the cross he died a horrible death. And on the cross his blood was spilled. And then after, a few, after his death he was taken down from that cross and he was placed in a, a cold, borrowed tomb. And in three days he had victory over death and sin by being resurrected from the grave. This is what Jesus did for us, amen? This is what he did. And knowing God as our Father helps us to have the confidence that we rely on, the grace, the mercy, and the forgiveness. You see, knowing God as Father allows us to approach God when we're in need of forgiveness. And so this idea that God is our Father, our Abba, Father, the reality that this is who He is, is one of the most healing doctrines in all of Scripture. To know your Lord and your Savior as Father is healing. One of the things that Jordan mentioned 
when they were leading us in worship is he says, I don't know what you've walked in with. And some of you have walked in to this place in need of healing. And there's something about going to the Father that helps everything. I want to encourage you this morning to maybe allow prayer to be the starting point if what you walked in here is indeed something that needs attention, that needs grace, that needs mercy, that needs forgiveness, that needs hope, turn to the Lord in prayer. So next, what we see, so Jesus, he focuses upward. He gives us these three examples. But then what he does next is he begins to focus on our well-being. In other words, he sort of directs, he, he sort of spoke of the vertical, now he speaks of the horizontal, right? He begins to speak to us to help us to understand what it is that we need to understand about how prayer can bring about one of the greatest blessings in our life. He, he continues in his prayer in verses 11 through 13. Jesus says, also, when you pray, pray like this. He says, give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so Jesus here, he mentions three things that we can pray for concerning our needs, first and foremost. And here, when he says, give us our bread, our daily bread, he's no doubt speaking of those physical and spiritual needs that we have as as followers of Christ Jesus, there's nothing wrong with you asking God for what you need in your life. He already knows that you will. He desires that more out of your life. And so as we read through this, we begin to, we begin to see that Jesus says, ask him for your daily needs. He goes on, he says, ask him for forgiveness. This is something that is so critical to you. Forgive us of our debts, of our trespasses, of our sins. Forgive us, Lord, as we even forgive others. And then he goes on to say, pray for protection. Pray that God would not lead us into temptation, which he never will, but deliver us from evil because we know that there is an enemy who does want to destroy our life. And so here, Jesus says, it's important that you know that God cares for your needs. It's important that you know that, that God cares. Listen to this now, that God even cares for the little things in your life. Even the little things. Do you hear that? Not just the big things. Even the little things. You say, well, Pastor David, I, I don't sometimes feel like he hears my prayers or he cares for the little things. When verse 8 of this passage that we're looking at in this text that we're looking at, he says this, this is the word of God. We know it to be true. We know it to be errant, right? And so here he says this. He says, he says for your father knows what you need before you ever ask. It's good to go to the Lord and pray for that which you need. But he knows about it before you. Here's what I would even argue that he knows about it before you even thought of it as a need in your life. He saw it coming, listen to this, before you were born. You were in your, okay, it's time to quit. <laughs> I got three minutes according to my phone. But I'll wrap it up. I don't know, maybe we just need to hold the second service back and just keep on, I mean, this is good stuff. So God knows what we need before we ask. Matthew 6, 26 says this, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they if you came in here this morning and you were feeling worthless, I hope that this passage just lifted you up. Because Jesus cares for you. Your Father in heaven cares for you. He cares about the big things in your life and he cares about the little things in your life, just like he cares for the little birds of the air. But he cares for you. And maybe that's what you needed to hear today more than anything else in your life. 
Maybe you're dealing with relationships. Maybe you're dealing with finances. Maybe you're dealing with uncertainty. Maybe you're dealing with the things that are going on in this world. Who knows? Whatever it is you brought in here with you this morning, God cares about those things not discouraging you, not destroying you, not causing you to weep, not causing you to suffer. He cares about you. He is our rescuer and our redeemer. Amen? Amen. You know, Jesus, when we look at him in the, in the gospels and we hear about him in the, in the epistles, we're always seeing that Jesus cared greatly for people. He always was caring for people. Once Jesus was needing rest after a long day, and, but the crowds continued to come. The disciples were a little bit frustrated. They knew he needed his rest. They tried to discourage the crowds. Y'all need to go home, but they were still gathering. And they come to Jesus and they say, these people want something to eat and we have nothing to give them. And he says, feed them. And they're like, well, I don't think you heard us. We don't, we're, we're down to just five loaves of bread and two fish, and it's not going to happen. And Jesus says something really powerful. He says, bring them to me. We know why he said bring them to me, because Jesus was, it said in the Scriptures also, that he had compassion for them. We see one of the greatest miracles in the Scripture where Jesus fed 5,000 with just five loaves of bread. Five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus was always caring for people. Now, before I run out of time, and I know some have already thought I have, uh, <laughs> I'm just picking on you this morning. I think that was awesome. Thank you for contributing to our message here this morning. It was fun. And actually, I've, mine has said I've run out of time as well, so. But before we just absolutely run out of time, because I've never really paid much attention to that anyway, right? Um, there's something else that I want to show you here. And I think it's so important. We must remember the giver in the midst of the gift. As we pray for those things that we need, as we pray for forgiveness, as we pray for as we pray for protection, as we pray and we ask God, God, I need you in my life, come in here. We never need to elevate the gift that he gives us above the giver, amen? Because you see, it's really all about him. You remember I said at the, the beginning of this message that the ultimate purpose of prayer is to glorify the Father. Through our prayers, as we pray to God, as we seek Him, we are ultimately bringing glory to God because there is nothing in that moment of our life as we, as we stand before God, whether it's in our prayer closet very privately or in the midst of a, a Bible study where we're publicly praying in a small group or whether it's here on stage as we lift up our voices in prayer, there's nothing that really glorifies God more because in that moment of our life, we are declaring that there is nothing more important than God. And that's why we stop and that's why we pray and that's why we lift up our voices. And so ultimately our prayers, they, they glorify God. God is, God is a God of provision. That's why Jesus says you can turn to him in need. God is a God of pardon. That's why he says you can turn to him in forgiveness. And God is a God of protection. That's why he says you can go to him when evil is in your presence. But it's still about God. Not about those things that we need. And although nothing benefits us more than prayer, God's ultimate purpose is is to be glorified in our prayer. There is no greater way that you can worship God than turning to God in prayer. Because it's you and it's Him in that moment. John 14, 13 says this, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified and the Son. So think about what Jesus is saying. He says, whatever you pray, whatever you ask in my name, I, true, he is, the, he is the giver 
of all life. He is the one who can bless beyond measure. But he says, if you go to him and you pray, and you, you pray and you ask God, whatever is asked in my name, I will do it. So that, what? Not that you would be blessed, even though you will be blessed, but that the Father will be glorified in heaven. Let us never forget that it's not the gift that matters as much as the giver. Someone once said this, they said, true prayer brings the mind to immediate contemplation of God's character and it holds it there until the believer's soul is properly impressed. Man, I love that. You see, the mind contemplates God in prayer while the rest of you just sort of waits. Isn't it remarkable how the mind does that? You just start thinking about things and all of a sudden you just get this overwhelming sense of blessedness right? The soul catches up with the mind. I love that. And so just like true worship, true prayer always focuses on God's glory, not just man's need. So this morning, I hope that you can take something away with you as you, as you prepare to leave here. In just a moment, we're going to lift up our voices in song. And, but more importantly, I hope and I pray that as we finish out these last few moments in worship that you'll remember to keep your eyes on the author and the perfecter of your faith, the Lord Jesus Christ.